I want you to turn to the book of St. Luke. I'm not going to preach it. I want you to, I want to read this to you. Luke 15 <clears throat> says, Then drew near to him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eat with them. Now they were the proud Pharisees. And, you know, they, you know, they felt they were doing God's will. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so when Jesus comes on the scene doing something different and they criticized him, so he was there with sinners and receiving sinners and those, they was like, this man, he can't be no prophet. He, you know, prophets, they don't mingle with sinners and da-da-da. But anyway, so Jesus spake this parable to them and said, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he had found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented more than over 90 and nine just persons which need no repentance. Everybody see that? Either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it, and when she had found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I've found the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided to them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wanted, wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his, into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave to him. And when he came to him, he said, came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my vowed fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring forth the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now the elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, thy brother has come and thy father has killed a fatted calf because he had received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. 
And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time your commandments, and yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was me that we should make merry and be glad. Well, this your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, the Bible says, verse 18, and Jesus came after this was a, after he rose from the death, dead and appeared to his disciples. Jesus came and spake to them, saying, "All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even." to the end of the world. I'll tell you something. Not every church is going to be large. But every church should be doing the will of God. And I know to a large degree everything rises and falls upon leadership. I know all the antics, I know all this that they've shared. But there were small churches in Jesus' days, but they got the truth. And a church will never remain small if they take heed to God's word. I'm a firm believer that if a church stays small all the time, there is a problem. I believe that with my whole heart. Should we have 500 or 1,000 people, I will still believe the same thing. I don't cut myself slack and say, oh, well, da, da, da. What the Lord shared with me years ago still remains true. He said, I said, Lord, can you give me some tips as to why some churches grow and some don't? What I shared earlier, he said, some people are like the Dead Sea. They don't, they just take in, they don't give out. And then he said, I forgot to tell you that earlier. He said, therefore, there's very little growth. That's what he said. Therefore, there's very little growth. Why? Because when churches take in, and don't give out. It's the same process of giving and receiving. If you receive and receive and receive and don't give, there's a problem there. But the Bible said it is more blessed to give, right, than to receive. Same principle comes when we're sowing as far as the harvest. The harvest is plenty but the laborers are few. Wow. You heard Jerusha's testimony. That was a good reminder. Thank you for that reminder, Jerusha. I didn't think about it like that, but it is so true. There was a, a tent meeting we had years ago with Pastor Webb. We were reaching out to the lost, and there was a lady that had she didn't have two lungs. I don't know how people can live, but that was her testimony of whatever the doctor said. And the lady always struggled with a breathing problem. God healed her instantly under the tent. She cried out, just cried out, began to testify that she didn't have two lungs, but she had, I guess, one. Or whatever the problem was, God healed her. There's another lady that we witnessed to in Grandin Village years ago. This lady 
she had a hurt that she had been hurt and holding on to for 30 long years. Her life was in change. She just couldn't do anything. We shared the gospel, prayed with her. She got saved. She hollered out. And she kept saying, 30 years, 30 years, 30 long years I've carried this. And here God healed me. If you want to see the miraculous, you got to go where the miracle is needed. All of God's people in here, you've been saved. You will see some healings and miracles, but many times somebody is in a desperate strait. But to the world, you can see miracles on a regular basis because people are hurting. God used to pick on yesterday. I told my wife about it. I remember we were out in the field and I didn't know who was going to show up, but I had told Toy while I'm going because we've been doing counseling on Saturday and so on. But I said, this Saturday we're going out there. And uh, I committed my wife before I talked to her <laughs> about it. I said, she said, you always commit me to something. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the point that I was making is that we, I went out there and then, uh, so I just felt like just letting her, you know, do the praying and whatever. So she began to pray, and I, and uh, you know, I'm after praying, I'm kind of peeking a little bit, seeing how they responded. Boy, God was zeroing in on their need, and uh, so as we were talking, she said, "The Lord had told her to fast that morning," and so she had a few words, "Well, Lord, so and so," but she obeyed God. God wants to use you. I don't know of any other way to say it. He wants to use you. The very thing you've been praying about, he wants to use you. And you get out there and you begin to experience that divine life flowing through you. You'll never be content anymore. You'll never be content anymore. When you lead a soul to Jesus Christ, there's a joy that comes like no other joy. You birth people. As a parent, you birth people into the kingdom of God. I'll share this. There was a spirit of intimidation that came when I first started the ministry. It followed me and followed me around. And I couldn't put my hand on it. I couldn't figure out what in the world so then in the late 80s, God healed me of fear. And I experienced a jubilation, a joy, and a freedom like I never knew possible. I kept saying, this is too good to be true. I didn't know I could... Be free, and that fear just colored all, every area of my soul and my life and my thinking. God freed me up. I was so excited, I was trying it everywhere, testing it. See if it's for real, man. It was so good. And I was timid, couldn't look people in the eye, you know, and all this stuff. People looked me in the eye, and you know, I looked down didn't have the confidence, but when God healed me, I'm looking them right in the eye, just enjoying it like, wow, God, this is unreal. This is so powerful. And some people had big eyes, you know, and I was like, (laughs) I mean, you know. (laughs) And so they could be intimidating. That's what I'm trying to say. Some of them were taller than I was, but I'm looking at them, man, just, just like, God, this is unreal. God, this is so awesome. So later the years came, and so some other hurts came back again. And that spirit followed me, and he tried to convince me, and it was so subtle that I couldn't discern what was happening. So the 
there was that intimidation again, but, and yeah, there's certain things, you know, you know to do because, you know, you just take a stand. But since we've been fasting as a church, I'm going to show you how powerful this thing is. I was talking to my wife, and we were talking about some situations and things that, okay, I need to deal with this thing. And so I went to God and said, God, you got to deal with this thing, whatever it is, I got to overcome this. And it was so aggravated. And then the Lord basically said, this, I, you already dealt with it. You just, he's just deceiving you. You just got to deal with it. And my wife and I was in prayer. And when he spoke that to me, I said, oh, my God. Man, I went to war and took authority over that devil says you foul spirit you will not and boy when I finished that same liberty came back again I said wow you know why I'm standing here staring at you and telling you the truth because I dealt with that spirit of intimidation and I want to say this to you those spirits will follow anyone a man was sharing I think his name uh, John Bevere I think his name is he was sharing about he was in revival God was moving by his spirit so powerful and just just incredible second night of revival a deacon said something to him whatever he said that spirit of intimidation came and when it came, the attack is reasoning and so on. He didn't realize what had happened. Come back the next night trying to run a revival and something was hindered. And he could not put his hand on it. He just couldn't figure out what in the world has happened here. The God was moving so. He went back, he prayed, he prayed. The second night he came, the third night he came back, the same thing happened. So he cried out to God, God, what is it? What's going on? God took him back and told him what the deacon had said to him to intimidate him. And then he uh, told him that, uh, so it opened him to that spirit of intimidation. And he didn't discern it and didn't deal with it. So it just hindered what God was doing. So once he did that, now he writes this book and he was sharing, dealing with spirits of intimidation. They're real. They're real. And if you don't know how they work, it can bind you for years and you don't know how you think it is you and you will be hindered for years. But once God let me know, he said, no, you know, no, 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 you don't need to be delivered. I delivered you in the 80s from that spirit. But he came back to influence you. And this is why I say, now God's going to do a lot more deliverance for us, for you and I, but I, I want you to know this when he delivers you, you have to be aware because the spirit will come back and try to make you feel like you hadn't been delivered. And if he does, then you cannot function in the freedom and the power that God intended for you to function in. But hallelujah to the lamb. I am free. My God, I'm free. <laughs> hallelujah. Glory be to God. Saints, if you don't know the power of how spirits can hold you back, you need to know this. But thank God, the weapons of our warfare. Mm. My, 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 my. Jesus. Mm. The Bible says they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Man, I tell you, you, you just got to experience that. Something been intimidating you and you can't seem to do, then it's a spirit of intimidation. You deal with that devil. Deal with him. And you, somebody say, I don't know if I can deal with it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. When you realize that it's not in you, following you maybe a generation but when you understand that you can deal with it 
I remember a witchcraft spirit that I had to deal with and I didn't understand how witchcraft was working, hindering me. And see, they're clever and you need to know this. I didn't understand how they could hinder a person's life. Even though you're a Christian, even though you're saved, even though you speak in tongues, even though you pray, if you don't discern who they are and how they work, they can hold you back for years. But when you discern, so I had this spirit of uh, uh, witchcraft and it has hindered and followed and I didn't understand it, how it worked then. But God showed me and he said, you can take authority over it. And when he showed me that, A spirit of witchcraft is, uh, is the same in, in most cases as a spirit of intimidation. They come to hinder you. They come to int intimidate you. They come to control you. It can work in others and it can work in you if you aren't careful. But if you discern what it is and how it works with the authority given unto you as children of God, you can stop it. You can bind it, break its power, shut it down, cancel its effectiveness. Instantly you will feel the freedom and there's nothing like freedom that comes from God. I am excited. God Almighty, Lord have mercy. God is good, saints. Hallelujah. <laughs> God want to do that for each and every one of us. Whom the Son sets free. He's free indeed. I know some may be groping with fear, but you don't have to. I want to put that out. That's on the tail end of witnesses. You can be free from everything that makes you afraid. God has not given us. You got something to share, babe? You look like you got something to say. God has not given us the spirit of fear. You, you, you're looking at a man that grew up so Timid, embarrassingly timid. But you're looking at a man that Jesus set free. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot of us men, we got to be free to bring the leadership to our home and our families to the cities, we gotta be free. Because spirits of intimidation goes for the head. Y'all got to hear what I'm trying to tell you. I'm excited. Oh my God, I could just go on and on and on and on, but I, I know as men, you gotta hear what I'm saying. You got to hear what I'm saying because you got to stand up. No! Hallelujah. You can't lead if that spirit of intimidation is coming. Sometimes it passes down through the generation. And our wives want us to stand up. And be men. Wow. My God. Mm -mm -mm. Can you do this, Brother Heron? I've been free, brother. You know, I mean, I can't say it no other way. Hallelujah. When I found out that thing was following me and what it was, 
then it's time to deal with it. I know, I'm just trying to whet your appetite. I want you to get stirred in your soul. I want you to, uh, men to rise up and say, oh my God, I got some work to be done here. Men, you're like lions. You must guard your turf. Ah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> you must guard your turf. The lion, he walks around and he's got a certain territory. And if anybody comes within that sphere, they're going to have to meet the lion. Then. Don't you just love this? God of my Jesus. God is good. God is calling us men to stand up and let the Lord use us. Most of the time, our wives lead us, but they want you to lead. Uh-oh, am I meddling? Okay, let me leave that alone. Okay, let me leave that one alone. I'll leave that one alone. But anyway, when you get free, come baby, you got something to share? Stand up, baby, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, she was just witnessing. Oh, yeah, 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 it's good. It's so important. And uh, see, men were made in the image and likeness of God. And so what the Lord said to me many, many, many years ago, and I, I think I'm, I'm sure I shared this. I don't share all my little experiences. My wife and I was laughing about it. I says, I, there's no experience that I haven't shared. So when I share, they say, oh, yeah, I don't heard this a thousand times, you know. <laughs> but every now and then I come up with one they hadn't heard. said, oh, Lord, I ain't heard this before. <laughs> but anyway, God is good. But God is good. God, and I, I laugh, we laugh because it, it said that I got to get some new experiences, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but going out in the witness is going to give us some new experiences. But I, there's uh, so many things that we pass and, and sometimes we get to another audience and God begins to bring out things that I've forgotten for years. And it also depends on the audience. So, but God, uh, I was sharing to the men that and, and by the way, I want to get with the men. I want to see the men right after service. Um, I feel like God, the Lord told me to get with the men. We're going to teach them. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk. We're going to pray. And we're coming out like the lions. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This place ought to be full of men as well. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, God, God's going to do it. And a brother that has a prophetic ministry, he said, man, he said, you're going to have, it's, it's, actually, you're going to have more men than women. And I was like, for real? <laughs> but I can see now that something had to take place. I had to deal with that spirit of intimidation. I'm excited. I could just go on and on and on, but I'm not going to go on because when the sun sets free, he's free. And it feels good. It feels good. And men and women alike, when God frees you, it feels so You would rather have freedom than anything else. Let's pause for a praise break. Lord, I thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. It came. Now I'm going to give this plug for Jesus. It came. Because Jesus looked at a timid, cowardly young man that grew up afraid of his father, afraid of life, afraid of people and everything else. And he says, I want you. It's like me? 
You can't mean this, God. Yes, I do. Yes. He said, I want you, that timid, backward, cowardly young man from Samson County, <laughs> North Carolina. Wow, God. Mm, mm, mm. This is for his glory. This is for his glory. Hallelujah. Only Jesus Christ can make a man free when he don't know how to break free on his own. Only Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for the words that's been shared. I hear the Lord talking, Nick. I hear the Lord talking as I'm talking. I hear him talking. Ah, God. He's going to satisfy the longing in your soul. Lift your hands, Nick, and give God some glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, you do it because you know just what to do. You know how to get into the crevices of our soul. By your mighty power, O Lion of Judah, who break chains and fetters of who loose the bands of wickedness to let the oppressed go free. Set them free now by your divine power and we'll give you the honor. Show forth now your mighty strength in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, God, I thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah, the Lion of Judah. He's a master at what he does. He does it well. Hallelujah, Jesus. Uh, I want to thank the Lord for his goodness. I, you know, my wife reminded me, she said, we've got to get our offering. I said, later. I said, later. God is a good Savior. You can't go wrong by giving him your all. You can't go wrong. He'll never let you down. He'll never let you down. You gotta commit though. Because if you don't commit, you leave room for Satan. And he's gonna go into that door and harass you, but be free in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask my wife to come down. She's smiling. You like what you see, baby? <laughs> I remember her saying to me, honey, we need to deal with so-and-so. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, but <laughs> my God. Mm. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know what, uh, as a woman and a strong-willed woman, sometimes we don't understand what God is, is doing in our lives when he breaks us down. But sometimes women, we try to uh, go ahead of our husbands and we try to uh, exert control and, you know, 
But one thing I have learned in these 10 years of <laughs> 11 years of marriage is that you got to wait on God. Because he be breaking you down and you don't understand, Lord, well, why, is, why am I going through this? But he have to humble you so he can bring the man in the place that he want him to be. You know, and so you have to take down and you take back and you shut up, you know. But while God is working on your headship, which is very important, you know, because if, if it's done the other way, it's out of order and it's unbalanced. I didn't understand what God was doing. I was, I was, I felt intimidated. But it wasn't an intimidation where I feared. It was just that the Lord was doing something in me that I didn't understand. And that was humbling me and putting me in my place so that the man could come up to the place where God wanted him to be. Did y'all hear that? I was a piece of work. No. <laughs> I was a piece of work. I can tell the truth and shame the devil. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it is the best way. Because things flow better, you get God's results, you know. And when you exalt your mate and put in him in the place where he need to be, God will bring you up. You know, it's not a thing where somebody's putting you under their feet. But it's an elevation for you, but it's a spiritual elevation. You know, it's a, a settledness and a deep assurance because you're walking evenly now. Where before you were walking ahead. So there had to be a breakdown on the inside. I know I'm telling the truth. Oh, You know, we don't deal with stuff. We talk over it, around it, but we got to talk to it now. And see, when we talk to it, it'll straighten it and, and cause divine alignment. And that's what God wants now. He wants divine alignment. Hallelujah. See, the, the head's supposed to lead. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> it was so in the beginning but the woman went ahead of the man let the devil deceive her she knew what the truth was she knew she wasn't supposed to eat that fruit irregardless of what the reasons were but why am I going here But when she uh, usurped her authority over the man, she got him in trouble, her in trouble, and got the devil in trouble. That's a terrible influence. But God now is causing us to get, get it back in order. And the church will rise up it will rise up and rise up in the strength of the Lord. You know, sometimes men are beat, our men are beat down so much. Put down, you know, disrespected. You know, my husband used to tell me, he said, you know, when you go, and I, I didn't really know if that was correct or not, but he used to tell me, he said, when he would go in to and transact business, that they will always look to the woman and not to the man. And so, you know, I kind of you know, paid attention to what he said and was looking. 
And sure enough, they would look at me. They wouldn't even look at him. Because you know why? Because we always going ahead of them. And they know that. And so I had to learn. He taught me how to stay in my place and my position. Even in my home, I don't answer the door. I don't answer the door in my house most of the time, unless he's not there available, because he's the head of the home. If you don't have a mate, it's different. You're the head of the home. But when you have a man in the house, he's the authority, he's the um, protection and security for that home. But he taught me that, and I learned. You know, and so I'm, the Lord had to break me down in some areas because I was used to being in control. And I had a husband for 20 plus, 29 years previously to this marriage. And I didn't understand that. I didn't have that principle working in my life. I was controlling things. I was running things in the home. You know, it should not have been. <laughs> And so I just thank God, ladies, if you humble yourself, it doesn't mean your husband going to beat you down. You know, he'll begin to respect you, and he will elevate you. He will elevate you. But he can't elevate you if you're always on top of him, on going ahead of him, you know, and that's why we have so much problems in the home today. It's because people got their uh, headship out of order. So let the men lead. One time I saw a shift in the ministry. I've been, been here long enough to see it. A shift in the ministry where the men begin to come up. They begin to take the initiative and prayer and it seemed like the women were, you know, kind of pushed back a little bit. But God knew what he was doing. And it felt good to have men in leadership and taking the spiritual headship. And it was happening in this ministry. And then they got the men's ministry going. And after they got the men's ministry going, the men was just going out doing things. I said, oh, wow. But... Uh, I don't know, men. I don't know what happened. You know, you got to come back up now. You got, and women, we got to let them. You know, if your husband say, honey, we're not doing this, so and so, say, okay. Don't give them a whole lot of lip, even if you don't agree with it. Pray about it. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't be afraid to take the lower road. It's the way up. Amen. 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 Amen.